Hello again, it's me, Harry, and I am your host at uh, CXO, uh, where we feature leaders in tech and business and looking at some of the things they do, some amazing work that they do uh, that impacts our society. And today I have a friend, a colleague, uh, somebody I've worked with, somebody who is really, really pleasant to work with uh, in studio. And uh, please welcome Mushemi Wambogo. Mushemi. Karibu. Asante sana. It's, it's been a while. It has been. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. Yeah? And how are you? Good, good, good. How good, are things good. happening? All right. Yeah? All, All right. right. Yeah. yeah. I see your name everywhere nowadays. I see you in different places I go, people I speak to. Uh, you must be doing some amazing work. Well, uh, we are fortunate to be, <laughs> to be working, but at the same time, it's, it's been a real good ride. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot happening in the country, as you know. Yes. And so, yeah, we are glad to be participating, finally, in nation building, as it were. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Who is Wambogo? Who is Mushemi? <laughs> who is, who are you? <laughs> you, know, you know, a lot of people see you, uh, and, and, you know, in very interesting places, but also very quiet. You, you know, a lot of people don't know what you really do. So who, who are you? Hey. Interesting. Um... <clears throat> so I'm a technologist, let's start there. Okay. And I, um, my passion is in doing tech work, mm -hmm. uh, programs, uh, and running change within government institutions. Okay. So that's really what I do. I've been an advisor for governments for now more than maybe 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, from consulting with uh, the big houses like Deloitte and PwC, I uh, decided to focus a lot on the tech transformation what government was trying to go through. Then from there, obviously, started a small company uh, and ran it for a while until uh, Tony Blair Institute came and, and said that they are interested in starting this work as well in helping focus change within government mm -hmm. uh, from the center of government. So in a nutshell, I do technology transformation work for governments. Nice. It's 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 a big thing. Yeah, I I, I, I don't thing. I don't even understand what it is. <laughs> it's yeah. a very big thing, meaning very different things to so many different people. So yeah. we attempt at pinching it a little bit. Yeah. 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 But you're also a CIO at one point. Yes, but that's a long, long time ago. But tell me about it. <laughs> so it wasn't really I wasn't really a CIO. I was uh what you call a delivery project executive. And basically, that was my stint within the IBM era when I was in, in California. And the idea was to, IBM would sign very large contracts with, with uh, different organizations. In our case, they had a very large contract with uh, Novartis, which is a biopharma uh, organization. And so what I did is rent teams across the globe in trying to provide service delivery to the client. So mm -hmm. what they do is that they would outsource all the IT work. And so we would support them in that scope. So that's the extent of my CIO realm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I've been mostly the tinkering guys on the back end, yeah. not necessarily the front end as okay. far as CIO as we define it. Okay. Yeah. So, so how did you transition to now consulting? That's a great question. So what happened was, after you do this work for a while on the backside, uh, rather on the back end of things, you start to realize that a lot of the influence of decision making comes on the front end. And mm -hmm. so what I wanted to do now was to try and say, OK, all this information that I have now, can I transition it to try and help people on the business side of things? And just as a background as well, I also have a business degree. So I wanted to see, can I be able to influence some of the decision making uh, on the front side. So an opportunity came. Um, mm -hmm. A gentleman who was a good and close friend, he's now late, John Kerry, asked me to, oh, to come. Yes. Yes, 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 he asked me to come and, and, and work in, in Kenya, uh, starting his practice for technology transformation, um, work at, at Deloitte. So that was my first real stint, client-facing uh, work for, uh, for, for you know, for the transition, if you will. Mm. So <clears throat> the idea here was it's fun 
to be on the implementation side, but it's even better to try and influence decision making as to the kind of work that you want to do. So that's when we started the, the work in, in, uh, in tech at, at Deloitte. And I had some wonderful colleagues. Uh, uh, one of them is, uh, is Agnes, and I'm sure you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She's actually the one who actually opened the doors for me for public sector work because we knew that if you don't do any public sector work, you have nothing to eat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so she had very large contacts and I wasn't, I did not know anyone here at the time. Because you're, you're like fresh from the board. I was completely <laughs> fresh. This is like 2008, I didn't know anyone. So she just said, come here, you don't know anything. <laughs> Grabbed me and, and we walked the streets, we walked the corridors and started building uh, my relationships from there and mm. started to build uh, networks from there. And so found actually it's not a bad environment to be in uh, because government will have the biggest opportunities but also have the biggest problems. And so if you can use your technology skills to try and help them see uh, the directions based on some of the experiences you've had, I think you end up becoming uh, quite an asset to many of them. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Now, one of the biggest, uh, and, and this, one, this one is something that I've witnessed, mm -hmm. um, you know, getting out of a big brand like Deloitte mm. and, and PwC yeah. uh, to starting your own business, yeah. Uh, you don't have the brand behind you, yeah. so you have to build that brand. Yes. How, how, do you trans how did you manage to do that? That's good. Uh, the, the biggest thing I think with that is trying to understand what is your personal brand. Mm -hmm. Because your personal brand should be, in my opinion, lent to another big brand. So you look at it as a partnership as opposed to being subservient to a bigger brand, particularly when you have large experience. So I had developed a strong personal brand in the market. And so partnering, I found that I usually would partner with my other brands. And so by the time I left, uh, I was able to actually apply my personal brand to try and build my small consulting house at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. And how is that? How, how difficult, how easy, how tricky is it? Actually, at the end of the day, everybody wants to see that big name anyways. <laughs> so you struggle quite a bit. <laughs> and then you realize you had so many latitudes and so many opportunities that you could use under a big brand name that you now can't apply in your own little startup. So just like every other startup, you're trying to open the doors to knock to one of the big things they're asking you is, what are your qualifications from <laughs> other countries? And you're thinking, oh my God, I, I actually don't have those other than what I used to do with these, with these other companies. Yeah. So slowly, but you start, there are some people who are in your network who give you opportunities. Mm. And so when they give you opportunities, they allow you to start building that brand and to also to start building those qualifications in order to start competing in the marketplace. Mm. Yeah, but it wasn't easy. I would imagine, yeah, because, you know, it's, uh, you know, when you're sitting behind those big brands and it's a brand selling, then yes. p possibly you. Yes. Yeah, but then, so, so what, what are the key uh, lessons that you can share uh, in, in that transition? Uh, be patient, that's one. Yeah. Uh, because the, the efforts that you seem to be making don't seem to make sense uh, because you're saying, I need money and I need money now, or I need opportunity, I need opportunity now. Uh, so just being patient and understanding that things do take time, particularly mm -hmm. in the areas that you want to focus on. Number two, I think, is to realize that for the first time as a startup, you're on your own, my friend. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people whom you expect to, to be there for you may not be there because they're also focusing on what they need to do. So you need to be tampered, in essence, being strong in uh, having a strong will to try and push. A and I think the third is trying to uh, master the courage to organize people to deliver a product that will make the client come back to you. Mm -hmm. I think that is, that is critical. Okay. So yeah. brand building, basically. Brand building, yeah. Okay, mm. okay. Now, now tell me about your work at uh, Tony Blair. Yes. So w what exactly do you do? So now I'm supposed to, I was supposed to have been pushing a small startup business, but then 
I got an opportunity that I, it was very hard to, to let go of. And that is actually working at the center of government to try and bring change. Uh, the Tony Blair Institute actually works on three, uh, actually it works on the following areas. One is it tries to apply policy and strategy and delivery, but actually underlined by technology. technology. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, they worked straight with the center of government, so working with the PDUs of the presidential delivery unit, uh, just like they're working with PETS now and GDS, which are the Presidential Economic Transformation Secretariat um, in the presidency. Uh, but then they realized quickly that there's a gap, and the gap was even if you were to do delivery on policy issues, nowadays everything is running on tech. Mm. Secondly, a lot of governments are now looking and saying, how do we automate? How do we try to get at the front end of that cutting edge in order to try and bring change to our citizens quickly? And so tech becomes another play point. Mm. So they needed somebody to try and help them to try and scope out the opportunities within the sectors that are in the country. Mm. And so I came in to do that. Now it's, gosh, it's over two years ago Already? Now. Yes, <laughs> it's amazing. And so I was, I, was, I was hired as a consultant to do that. And so essentially we mapped out the different areas uh, that they could be involved in in order to see sizable and impactful change mm -hmm. uh, to the country. So they are not all bad. I think it's, it's been an amazing journey so far. Okay. Yeah. So, so how, how was the, your previous work how did how did that prepare you for this so two things one is obviously the networks that you've created over time uh, mm -hmm. come to play because you, a lot there are very few people that now you haven't worked with that you now can call on mm -hmm. number two you also understand the landscape very well particularly based on all the projects that we've done like i remember when when we in pwc we did some very big work with government in different government ministries so you understand how some of the government processes work mm. and what it is that they're trying to achieve. And then three, you're now trying to say, okay, well, we have somebody else who's willing to participate to help bring that change to government. And so if you combine those three things, you're able now to come up with some strong value proposition mm. on how to change the aspects of government service delivery. Interesting. Yeah. EGAV is one of, I think, it's, 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 it's one of my passions actually you know uh, getting government to use technology in a most eff effective and most impactful way yeah. um and and now there's there's a whole conversation about digital transformation mm -hmm. in government mm -hmm. is this a conversation that you're having within within your work yes so there are three big projects that or three or four big projects that we're working on mm. so we're in three sectors right now we are in ICT, if you'd call that a sector, we are mm. in health, and then we are also in agriculture. Now, you talk about digital transformation. Obviously, there's a spectrum before you even get to digital transformation. First of all, the, uh, the aspects, and you've gone through it, of digitizing records. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of manual records need to be digitized, because even if you're going to talk about AI or any of that stuff, these things have to be in the system. Mm. Then there's the digitalization aspect of it, which is discussing the process flows, discussing the workflows, looking at how now to take the tools that can be embedded within government processes to help governments to start to see. And some of those results would be like dashboards and, and starting to see. And then you go to transformation. And actually the aspects of transformation really, you're trying to look at, uh, as my late friend John used to say, the people, the processes, and the technology. Correct. And unfortunately, a lot of the people aspects are not, are not addressed because uh, everybody's focusing on the new and sexy toy, but yeah. they forget about the people who actually are supposed to drive that change. Secondly, you're going to come up to very significant government bureaucracies that somewhat may need tinkering and changing in order to adapt to the new tech that including is coming. Including policy. Again. Including policy. Regulation. Exactly. Okay. So some of our work, we are trying to help with the policy work. We're also trying to help with regulation. Uh, like, for instance, if you're looking at, at, at health, you're looking at e-health bills to, in order to have government be able to actually incorporate a lot of the tech in, in coming out with impactful health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So 
when we talk now about the transformation, we're also now talking about, in addition to the processes and bureaucracies and policies, there's also, do they have the people that can be able to support these changes mm. so that they are sustainable moving forward? And so all those things are things that we are trying to do. So our model is really we embed advisors within government mm -hmm. in order to help the transition and also help sustainability in parting the knowledge and information to the people who are resident within those ministries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how difficult or easy is that? There's nothing easy in government. <laughs> <laughs> There's absolutely nothing easy in government. Yeah. Um, but I think you eat the elephant a piece at a time, just slowly, and, and trying to monitor the changes. So in essence, is the question easy or hard? It's difficult. It's difficult as it is challenging. But I think what we have in this current government is we have the will. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the interest. And we have the excitement. And we have people who are ready to make changes. And so if you have that, and particularly support from the top, because if you don't have that, then nothing gets done, yeah. then you're able to start to effect changes very quickly because then you have the government machinery ready to adjust itself to help you succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so technically, you guys are already doing dual transformation because right. it's, it's, it's a transformation uh, from the policy, the processes, right. and then this transformation from the technology side. Yes. Is that, is that what you... Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. So on the policy side, so for instance, we have a lot of policy work that is going on in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, because in agriculture, we're trying to set up an ag data platform. And an ag data platform really is to bring, harmonize all these farmers that we have, 4 million plus, in order to see whether the government can have a good view and therefore can monitor inputs all the way to outputs, mm -hmm. basically farm to fork type, type environment. But within that whole spectra, there are lots of issues. And the issues are partly regulation, partly policy, and then partly preparedness for tech as far as inputs are concerned. Mm. Don't forget you're also dealing with individual farmers who also need financing. So you have to create significant partnerships with people like Safaricom, DigiServe. You're also looking at other private sector players who have mapped out um, the landscape, uh, say like Remani, uh, mm. And also you're looking at uh, crop nuts who are looking at the nutrition aspect of soil in order to make sure that what is input into the, into the farms actually creates the necessary output. Because at the end of the day, if you put the citizen at the center, mm. you want a healthy citizen. And a healthy citizen requires nutrition and nutrition comes from proper monitoring of what it is that is coming into our land and therefore gives us better outputs for crops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what, what kind of technologies are you seeing uh, helping this whole process? So, so there, are two, there, are two, there are two schools of thought. Okay. There are those who are saying, okay, we have to go all the way open source with a lot of the different stuff. And, and there's a place. Then there are those who are saying there's proprietary work that needs to go on the base systems. I'm not sure that there's a right answer. I think part of it has to do with a lot of affordability aspects of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also the, the tech requires people, which means you need to find the people who are skilled in order to make those transitions happen. So there are tools and there are tools available. Uh, there are also other developers who are available to actually develop some of the top end tools. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to advise government is to follow a policy and then to follow what we're calling an enterprise architecture blueprint. Because then that gives you an idea about where the jigs or puzzle pieces are supposed to be placed. Mm -hmm. And then therefore, then develop on top of that. So a lot of the development work on top of the baseline development mm -hmm. should or could be all open source. But you need platforms that are actually embedded quickly that can harness the information so that it is safe, enterprise, and secure, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that government really needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that everybody is talking about right now is about digital ID. Yes, yes, yes. What's your take on that? Yes. Well, <laughs> not to be controversial or anything, but uh, I think that's a holy grail. If you talk about a cradle to grave situation for, for the citizen, I think it is the most 
important aspect of this government, or any government for that matter. For instance, I, I did a paper for the UN a, a few years ago, and we were trying to evaluate all the registration systems in the country. Mm -hmm. And you find you have more than 14 of them, and you have issues with actually tracking a person. Because let's assume, let me give you a, uh, an, an example. A child does standard eight and doesn't do well, and then decides to go back and repeat and so that they can better their, their scores. They use a different name for which the system doesn't know exists, and therefore is able to do these tests again. And then therefore that person is known as this new name mm -hmm. for the rest of the active life, but actually their true name <laughs> yeah. was domiciled somewhere else. Yeah. And part of that issue is, where do we start registering kids? Now we have the names and, and we have the health systems, etc. But when we look at it, we need a system that identifies you from zero. Mm. While as in systems, they were identifying people from 18 per se, so that you are actively involved in the system. that's when you get your ID. That's when you get your ID. Yeah. So now, if we can harmonize a way in which we can get people from zero, we can easily trace them. And I know people like from Estonia and all these other places are coming to tell us that that's actually what you're supposed to do. It's a no-brainer, but what I always caution people is, remember that you're working with a system that's already been configured in a certain way. Mm. So a lot of the work has to go back to try and figure out how does the system, through regulation and policy, the way it knows how to work, is adjusted in a way to start accommodating these new trends or this new way of working. Mm -hmm. So that when you have a digital ID, you have one. And therefore, it has subsidiary IDs, or what you'd call functional IDs, mm. in the different sectors. But actually, them Samakweli is just one. Mm. Which then single means... Single source of truth. Single source of truth. Mm -hmm. And so government can be able to actually store that information securely and be able to now distribute it based on what the function or the call is based on the function that uh, the sector requires. Mm -hmm. So... I'm a huge proponent of DID. In fact, all the work that we are trying to do rests upon a successful implementation of DID. Because if you're going to track farmers and you're going to track inputs, you're going to need a way in which you can identify that farmer. Correct. If you're going to try and set up a digital health platform, in order one day that you could have a digital passport so that if you're mugged outside here of your offices, any hospital that requires or gets you is able to actually treat you. Mm -hmm knowing the symptoms that you have and also knowing that the things that you're allergic to so they don't administer something that kills you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would require also DID. If you're looking at a child in benefits, you require DID. So I think there's an, uh, an also positive identification. There are people here with more than six IDs uh, mm. because the government can't really quite place who are you. Mm. Uh, and so I think it is a, it is a, it is a moment in time or a technology for which time has come, mm -hmm. and the adjustment for which government is trying to do is actually quite quite telling right now. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the sooner we can try and implement it, the better it will be for the entire society. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, because you know everybody is talking about it, and uh, I think it's 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 critical. The, there's uh, one. Uh, yeah, there are lots of misnomers about about DID. It's it's not. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot of information shared about the positives of actually having a positive identification in a DID process mm -hmm. as opposed to the fragmented nature. Because when you're looking at government resources and spend, when you're looking at, at outcomes in health, outcomes in agriculture, outcome in work, uh, preparedness for how this, this country positions itself within the region, all of that can work very comfortably if you have an identification of the citizens mm -hmm. in order to provide the services to the citizens as it is required. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, uh, I ask my guests this, yes. um, every, every guest who comes here, yeah. I ask them one question that uh, you know, oh, oh. sort of ticks them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I feed the fish right now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but what is that one thing? Mm -hmm. uh, that nobody in PwC, in Deloitte, in Sirius, in Tony Blair doesn't know about Moshemi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? Just one, thing? one thing. One thing. Yes. I think 
Everybody knows everything about no. me. Um, one thing. Yes. Jesus, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, you've stumped me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one thing that people don't know about me. Yes. Because everything that, that we're talking about, I know I'm very passionate about what I do. Uh, people know that. I'm a golfer, people know that. Mm -hmm. I'm a very proud parent. I think that's, that's something that people will not know. I think okay. you'll see, you'll probably see me out there, but I have three wonderful children and I love everything about them and I have uh, spent a great deal of my life with them. Okay. Uh, I guess all of my life with them. And uh, they are now adults and uh, uh, I think if there's one thing that people don't know about me is that I'd like to be considered an accomplished parent. Awesome. Yeah. That is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mushemi. Thank, Thank you for your time yeah. uh, and your insights. And uh, you know, wishing you all the best in 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 as you navigate this uh, digital transformation space, um, and all the work that you do. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Yeah. I'll be yeah. happy to come back again at any time. Awesome. And uh, all the best with this work that you do, because I think the things that you do for us is that you actually project what is happening from this great country, which is Kenya, and also. Projecting the kind of people that you can bring to this show, I think, is is a wonderful testament to the work that you do. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.